Hi, Jason with Unmatched Style here. Today I'm going to talk to you about Processing JS. Uh, processing JS allows processing visualizations to be run on the web. We're going to dig right in. I've already uploaded Processing JS to my web server, uh, and you'll see that the example comes with two functions. Uh, these are going to be what we'll use uh, for this entire example. Um, the setup function is run at the beginning of the visualization. It's run once, uh, unless I guess you call it manually later. Uh, draw is run at the beginning of every frame of your visualization. Now first we need to make sure that the size of the visualization is set properly. Uh, in the HTML where the canvas uh, element is specified, I've already said that it will be 400, uh, a width of 400 and a height of 350. Uh, we can set that here by using the size function. So 400 width and 3, excuse me, not 250, 350 height. Uh, and you'll see over on our page that it actually renders it, it begins to render it uh, at 400 by 350. Now it's given us a gray background. We haven't specified a background color. Uh, if we go back to our processing code, in the draw function we can specify a background color. Now calling the background function here uh, will essentially clear everything that we've drawn. Uh, if we draw anything later in this function it'll clear it again the next time draw is, is called in the next frame. Uh, we can simply pass background a color just like you would specify in HTML. Uh, we'll pass it white. Now this should clear to white. Good. So now we know that processing is running. We're manipulating this canvas element. So let's actually draw something to the screen. Uh, say at uh, x and y 100, 100, let's draw a uh, 10 pixel wide uh, and tall ellipse. We'll be using ellipse later in this example, so this is good. Now you specify uh, x, y, width, and height. So, x and y, width and height. Now we have ourselves a little ellipse uh, drawn at 100, 100, uh, and it's 10 pixels wide and tall. So that's the, this is going to be the basis for our example. What we're going to do is we're going to take this drawing uh, and we're going to start animating it. We're going to use the frame rate uh, to, to step over an animation. Now to have something interesting to animate, um, I've decided that I'll build a very simple particle system. A really trivial particle system. These things can get incredibly advanced. Uh, but we'll start with a basic class structure that will represent a single particle. Now the, the language itself, the processing language, is a really simplified version of Java. You see voids there. Uh, this isn't JavaScript. Uh, but processing js interprets all of this this java like language and produces something that can manipulate the canvas element uh, that's a little bit of magic behind the scenes we're going to focus on this now for a particle to to operate to to work it needs to know a couple things um, we need it we need to give it an x and y coordinate and we also need to give it an x and y velocity so xv will represent the velocity on the x-axis and yv uh, will represent the velocity on the y-axis. Next we need to affect each particle uh, by a certain amount of gravity. And finally, uh, actually we'll declare this here as well, each one of these particles they can't stay on the screen forever otherwise it will just be spewing ellipses all over the place and it'll be, it won't look very good. Uh, so we'll specify a life as well. Give each particle a lifetime, like a, a number of frames that it can exist before it needs to stop being displayed. Uh, for the constructor, you you don't have to specify a type for the, the function. It's not, it's not a void or, or an integer return value or anything. It's simply particle, the name of the class itself. Now we are going to initialize each one of these particles at a location. So we need an initial x and y to set x and y to, and then we can apply uh, the x velocity and the y velocity to that number. So let's say initial x, initial y. 
So we would set x and y to these values. And now we have uh, the beginnings of, of a particle. We have, we've encapsulated some of this stuff. Um, now, I'd say a, a good lifetime for a particle would be maybe 15 or 20 frames. So we'll, we'll give it 20 frames of life. Um, and finally, gravity needs to affect the particle, so you give some, you get some, some curvature, some, uh, some reaction to it being, say, fired up in the air. Um, so we'll give it uh, a gravity of one. So now we've initialized everything except the x and y velocity. Uh, if you go back to the processing reference, uh, processing provides a lot of built-in functions. And we're going to use one of these. We're going to use the the random function to produce a a number um, in a random range. We need these particles to sort of uh, explode in the different directions. So the initial x and y velocities uh, will be specified by this, and it'll give it a lot of randomness. But because we're using a range, uh, we can control the width and also the height uh, of the particle system itself. So the function is simply a minimum and a maximum value passed to random, uh, the function call itself. So we'll go back to our code. Uh, and our initial x velocity uh, could be something like negative uh, 5, so to the left of our animation, uh, 5 pixels, and uh, to the right of our animation, 5 pixels, or to, to the right of the origin of this particular particle. So the y velocity, this is the height. We need to give the height uh, something fairly large. I mean, we want it to be noticeable. Um, so you give it a, a negative 15 to a negative 20 velocity. So it will be traveling upward um, at 15 to 20 uh, pixels per frame. Now what we what we want to do here is we want to be able to do two different things inside of our particle class. One is we need to update these values uh, continuously as we're trying to animate this particle. Uh, so we'll give ourselves uh, a void update function where we can update all of these various attributes. Next we need to actually draw the particle itself onto the screen. So we'll give it a draw function as well. Now these two functions will be called every time the 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 visualization draw function is called, very much like we just called our ellipse. And in fact, we can just steal this piece of code here and put it down in our draw function. Now we recall that these two these values called to ellipse are the x and y coordinates of where we're going to call where we're going to draw the ellipse. Uh, and these are simply the width and height. We can leave these alone, but we can put in x and y. And of course, we're initializing those up here. So this will be drawn at the x and y coordinates, and all we have to do is update these coordinates uh, in the update function. And once we implement the, the particle list or the particle system itself, uh, we'll have a bunch of particles floating around. Now to update the coordinates we would want to apply the gravity uh, and the velocities to our x and y coordinates. So first what we'll do is we'll apply gravity. Uh, sounds simple enough. So if we simply add gravity to our y velocity, now we've sort of enhanced the y velocity by our gravity. And then finally you can add the velocities to their coordinates. Now we have uh, we have essentially everything we need. Uh, the one thing that we haven't used yet is the the life property of each particle. But we're going to skip that for a moment uh, so we can just uh, get these particles on the screen. Now to get them on the screen, we need to be able to contain these particles uh, in some sort of structure in a list. So as a global variable, we're going to specify an array list of particles. 
and this will hold all of our particles as we create them. Uh, now to loop over this array list of particles, we need a loop inside of our draw function. So we'll get a, a very simple for loop here, uh, int i zero, and as long as i is less than the number of particles on the screen, or not on the screen necessarily, but in our array list of particles. Then we can increment over that. Now in here, we're going to be calling a couple functions. We're going to be calling update to apply the gravity and the velocities to our coordinates. So we can, but first we need to get each of the individual particles out of the particles array list. And to do that, we can pull it out uh, as a particle object, um, pull it out of the array by its index. But we, we should, uh, to sort of keep this clean and understandable, we are, uh, each object stored in an array list can be any sort of object. Uh, but we want to make sure this is cast as a particle. Now we've pulled out the individual particle object, um, but we need to call both update and draw. So on that new p variable, first we call update to change its position, and then we draw it to the screen. Now you might have noticed that we haven't actually added any particles. Uh, to our screen yet. We've simply defined the particle class uh, and stored it store, and given it some sort of storage mechanism that we can put stuff into this particles uh, array list. Now, uh, processing provides some state information about what's going on uh, on the canvas itself. Now, if you look down here, uh, we can search for it. All of these mouse functions but you'll also notice that there are some state functions. These aren't functions. These are uh, sort of Boolean values that tell us whether or not the mouse is pressed. Uh, and this, we can use this uh, to add particles to our array list of particles. So if we simply, this state information is available wherever. Uh, if the mouse is pressed, this will return true. So if mouse pressed... we can do something. We can uh, create a new particle to add to our particles list. So the add method on the array list object, uh, we can insert a new particle uh, at the end of the list. So we can append one of these on there. Now if you recall, when we, uh, when we create our constructor down here, we need an initial x and y coordinate. Now, we, we don't want this to be a random coordinate because we need an origin that makes sense to the user, that, that will make the visualiz visualization make sense. Uh, so if you go back to some of those constants that they have or some of, those, um, that, some of that stateful information that they have, they also have mouse x and y. Now, this presents something pretty interesting. We can actually get this particle system to originate at the x and y coordinates of the mouse itself. So if we pass those in... mouse x and mouse y, uh, we can have each of those particles that we're creating when the mouse is pressed at the mouse x and y coordinates, uh, which should make for some pretty interesting animation. Now if we go back to our browser, uh, actually I notice here that we haven't set the frame rate. Uh, I apologize. We can go back this is pretty important because we don't want this to run too slowly because not enough particles will be generated by the way we're actually generating them. Um, if we set it at 30, uh, that should be fine. So 30 frames per second. Now if we go back to our browser, we can refresh our canvas. You'll see that we, nothing's being drawn yet. I'm not clicking on the, uh, on the canvas itself. But as soon as I start clicking, we start having this mass of particles explode out of the position uh, at which the mouse is. Now, you'll notice as this is running, we've, we've created two things. One are these, this infinite supply and lifetime of particles, 
and also probably a pretty significant memory leak because we're not cleaning up uh, anything in the in the array list that we allocated. We're not removing any of these. So I've stopped clicking now, uh, and I have no idea how many of those particles I created. But we'll go back, and what we can do is we can honor that life property here. So we've given it a lifetime of 20 frames. We need to decrement that lifetime and then check for it. So here, if we say if life is greater than zero, we need to decrement the life value. But up here, we need to honor the, the life value that's being decremented. So if we say if our particle's life is greater than zero, then I want you to pay attention to it uh, and animate it, uh, update it, and then draw it to the screen. Now we should have particles that are only alive for about 20 frames. Uh, now here, I'm not going to get into this uh, during this screencast, but here is where you would do the cleanup on the array list itself. So this is where you would solve a lot of your memory leak uh, issues uh, by removing the particles that have that have expired. Uh, now you wouldn't want to do this simply by calling remove on the index because array lists actually shift all of their uh, indices to the left if you remove an item. So you'd want to store what indexes are uh, have expired and then clean them up after the for loop. So if we move, if we go back to our browser now, now we should see uh, that each one of these lifetimes are being honored and only uh, only the particles that are still alive are being drawn to the screen. Now you see we have a nice nice uh, nice spout of particles here that expire, which gives us a, a great deal of control over how this uh, how this particle system works. But I hope you've enjoyed this screencast, this introduction to processing JS and a simple particle system. Thanks for watching.